John, thanks very, very much for joining us here at the World Voices Festival. I'm so glad to have you here. Um, thank you for doing it. Congratulations on your new book. I, I have to issue, um, I guess we would call it an omnibus trigger warning for this conversation, or like the mother of all trigger warnings, or oh, yeah. the motherfucker the, of the all. Motherfucker. Yeah, that's yeah, right. The motherfucker of all trigger warnings. Um, we're going to say an extraordinary number of bad words. I mean, you mainly. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna provoke you into saying uh, <laughs> really, really, really bad words. Um, so, if you're the kind of person who's watching this who doesn't like curse words, get out. Just get out now. It's crazy. Um, but presumably, you're here because you want to hear one of uh, the country's great linguists, uh, John McWhorter, talk about his uh, new book, Nine Nasty Words. Um, so be, before we sort of jump into some of these words and their meaning and the evolution of what is taboo in our language, uh, just 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 tell us, to, for starters, what's wrong with you that you would want to write a book like this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, who, you know, what, what, what's, what's, what's going on up here, John? You know, what's wrong with me is that I wanted to write a book that people would actually really have a yen to read. And that <laughs> meant writing a book about what people really care about with language. Steven Pinker, my friend, already wrote the book about whether or not there's a universal grammar in our genes. Lynn Truss already wrote the book about whether or not language is going to the dogs, and her answer was yes, which I would contest, but still. Then Gretchen McCullough last year wrote the book about language and the internet. After those three, I was thinking the only other topic that I can imagine everybody might really want to know about a lot is cursing. And there have been some other books about cursing, but I thought I'd like to try my my skills, whatever they are, at that, because I think it'll really stimulate some interesting discussions and people will really care. So I figure I'm I'm doing the fourth and final big topic in linguistics that I could think of that people who aren't linguists might really hanker after. And so that was my sickness. So so you basically you want to be what Melville was to Wales, you want to be to the word shit. Basically, you want to do the definitive. <laughs> or what are the other? Or what are the other books that came before that have that have plowed some of this ground? Granted, this is obviously the definitive book, but but what are the other? What's the other? It word? is kind of like Melville, and that he wanted to talk maybe too much about you know how you break down a whale, and he puts it within the format of this quote unquote novel. I yeah. want to talk too much about where fuck came from, but you have to put it in a package. But actually, the um the other books that really do deserve attention, Melissa Moore wrote a really good book called Holy Shit that describes the evolution of some curse words and profanity. And then Ben Bergen, Benjamin Bergen, who's a cognitive scientist and linguist, wrote a book called What the F? And Benjamin was a grad student when I was a professor at Berkeley. And I can say that one, he is brilliant. Two, it's a great book. And three, I like it because to a certain extent, he sounds a little bit like me when, when I write, he's got that tone. And so What the F? was a really good work on this subject. And I, I decided to go for a different angle, but I am working in a tradition that's fairly well-trodden, yeah. Right, right, right. But so so um, talk about how, I mean, I guess this is kind of an obvious question for people who are old enough to remember George Carlin, but talk about how you came to nine, um, nine nasty words. I mean, he had his famous seven. Well, why don't you actually, you know what, give us his seven, and give us your nine and maybe mm -hmm. you can talk about where 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 he went and where you're going you know what jeff because we live in informal times if you ask me for the seven i am going to move from here and run get the book because i don't have carlin seven in my head i'm back and so the carlin words it's been a while i wrote a book with my own words but with carlin's you have shit piss fuck cunt cocksucker motherfucker and tits so that was his words. And I found that interesting because Carlin was a while ago now. And I think that if we looked at what we considered the really bad words, some of those wouldn't be on it. And so, for example, opinions seem to differ on this, but I have never called anybody a cocksucker. I've never heard anybody called a cocksucker in my presence. I know what it means. But to me, it's a little bit 1974 and before. Um, it's like it's, kind of on the waterfront kind of era. Right. Thing. Yeah. 
fucker. You know, yeah, yeah, exactly. And you know, I hear from some people that maybe regionally it's more popular in some places than others, but to me, it's it's relatively archaic. And also, I just found myself thinking that in terms of profanity, in terms of quote unquote what you can't say on TV. Yeah. Nowadays, Carlin would have to include, for example, the N word and yeah. a very unpleasant word that begins with C that even I'm not going to say that refers to a female <laughs> part, etc. I thought that list in a way, not that it needs to be revised and that Carlin did something wrong, but we need to move on and examine it for today. So the nine nasty words in this book, and it really goes beyond nine. Nine nasty just sounds good because of the alliteration. It's really more like 12 words, but it's damn, hell, shit fuck, ass, dick, pussy, I'll say it once, cunt, nigger, faggot, bitch, and motherfucker. Those are our 12 nine nasty words. You've just probably canceled all of New York City by somehow <laughs> by doing that, by the way. This <laughs> no neighbor. Yeah. Your entire neighbor, it's like, it's like a neutron bomb of cancellation <laughs> that just went off. Um, let's... Um, Let's can we move through them a little bit? I want I mm -hmm. want to know. I'm I'm really interested in the the the, the taxonomy of, of cursing, and it's not just cursing because, as you point out in in this book, um, you talk about different phases in 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 history in which blasphemy was the thing, right? And then it was very uh, kind of bodily function oriented taboo words, and now we've moved to to where where slur words are the actual most taboo, you know, nastiest, nastiest words. But, you know, I'm, I'm very intrigued if you would talk a little bit about why you included words that, you know, obviously are, are often expressed in polite company, often used in polite company. Now, hell and damn. What, what interested you about them and why do you still include them in the nasty word category? They seem to be somewhat... Um, uh, I, I, their, their power and sting has, 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 has gone away. Maybe part yeah. of it, the hell issue and the damn issue, uh, in particular, uh, have something to do with the waning, the waning importance of blasphemy, or the waning exactly. that our our society at least gives to blasphemy. Yeah, I wanted to partly tell a story. I believe that you don't teach people things through just lists. And so even though this is a list of nine, 12 words, you want there to be some sort of narrative arc. And yeah, we know that damn and hell have lost so much power that they barely qualify as profanity. But nevertheless, if we're asked, you know, what are the four letter words? What are the bad words? What are the curse words? Still, spontaneously, we are likely to start with damn and hell, just like if you ask, name some fruits. You're going to start with apples and pears, although those two are probably nobody's favorite fruit, you know, especially if you have more of an assemblage to enjoy, apples and pears are dull. Yet the first thing you're going to say is apples and pears. Damn and hell are like that. And also, you're exactly right. Starts with blasphemy. Then in a way, it's what a society considers blasphemous. After a while, the body is blasphemous, so to speak. And then after a while in our times, and we don't always see it because fish don't know they're wet, the blasphemy is slurring groups. But you have to start somewhere. And so you have to start with right. a time when damn and hell were treated as hot pepper. Right. I shouldn't, by the way, I should, when I, when I say blasphemy, there, there are blasphemy, there's always blasphemy in our society. Sometimes it, it's become secularized, though. The, Precisely. The, you know, yeah. and, and that's, and that's, that, that's very interesting. So take us, take us through the, the evolution of what our society considers completely outside the bounds of, uh, of, of what you can and cannot say. And obviously, just to note, I mean, I don't think this is a spoiler alert. You do have a chapter on the N word and we'll talk about we'll talk about that because you do sort of put that in the primary spot now in terms mm -hmm. of the, the word with the most power. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but 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 talk about that evolution a little more. So you move through blasphemy toward yeah. uh, toward a, a, a long period in which bodily functions were considered you know, completely out of bounds. Go, go, go. Right. Maybe, you, maybe you can do a brief history of shit while you're well, one, he actually one place to start would just be the transition between the old days and now. And I'm 55. And so I have seen this transition. I think of there was an episode of the Dick Van Dyke show. This is a few years before I was born, early 60s, where mm -hmm. the plot has it that little Richie 
has um, indulged in a word in school. And of course, on the show, they can't say it. They can't say what it begins with. But it's obvious that Richie said fuck. And Rob Petrie and his wife, Laura, Dick Van Dyke and Mary Tyler Moore are treating this as if he said something truly sacrilegious. And you can't help thinking when you see the episode today, today that would be the N word and fuck wouldn't be so bad. In the early seventies, I was in um, even a rather bohemian place like a Montessori school. Some idiot wrote fuck on a box and the teacher got really upset and we all had to sit and wait until somebody confessed. And it felt like we waited for two hours. It was probably 10 minutes, but you know, we were eight. And that was considered a big, 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 big deal. Even today, I'll bet that would be a, way, that was a, Montessori school a, a big deal. Right? That was a Montessori school in Philadelphia. That was a Montessori school in Philadelphia. Philadelphia, I went to school in Philadelphia. They have a pretty high tolerance for fun. I mean, you would not, think. Yeah. You would think. And yet, and yet, back in 1974, still a statement had to be made, despite the fact that this place was sort of ahead of the curve on all sorts of things, including the counter culture. Today, that would be about the N word. That's something that's really settled in in terms of words like that, just over about the past 30 years. It's about what a society happens to be really hung up on and concerned about and uncomfortable about. It used to be swearing to God. Then it became what comes out of your butt. And then it becomes let's get past slurring groups. And here we are. I just want to note for the record that in the last two minutes, you've said fuck on a box and what comes out of your butt. And I'm sorry, <laughs> you know, I, I, I too am 55. And, you know, I, I kind of, like we're doing like some kind of high end Beavis and Butthead kind of. <laughs> There's a little of that. Where I just can't help but point out that you just said fuck on a box. Um, <laughs> the. Um, since we're on the subject, let's stay on the subject. I, I there's something you uh, something you wrote in the in the book that I hadn't fully realized that you actually date um, you date the transition from the use of the word to the euphemistic N word to Christopher Darden, one of the prosecutors in the O.J. Simpson trial. I, I, to, I talk about that. Talk about when when um, it be when it when the word became further kind of um, invested with this negative uh, power. There was an emblematicity to the speech that he made about it being the worst word in the English language. And before that, it's not as if we considered it to be a word that you were going to bandy about casually. There was an idea that you don't use the slur, that it's one of the worst things you can do. You were allowed to refer to the word in reference with taste. Usually you were criticizing the word when you did it, but you were allowed to utter the sequence of syllables. But he made that particular speech. The whole issue of Mark Furman having used the word figured so largely in that trial that so many people experienced more close up than people had experienced any trial before because of the nature of technology and the nature of the story. And so I wouldn't say that Christopher Darden caused it. He wasn't you know, the most effectual person in the world, but it did create a certain kind of discussion. And it has been ever since the mid nineties that the word has gone from being a slur that nobody, including me, would have bothered including in a book like this. This book would have been shorter if I had written it 25 years ago mm -hmm. to being the equivalent to what damn and shit used to be. And a lot of people think of it, you know, we, we fish don't know they're wet. We think on a day to day level, why are people being so uptight about the N word lately? But the answer is because the N word along with some other words have entered into the realm of profanity that any human society has in some way about some sort of topic or collection of topics. The only question is what is the society going to consider profane for us? It's slurring groups, despite that our default sense is that profanity is shit and fuck. But that's just accidental linguistic taxonomy. It's like tomatoes or fruits, we just don't say so. Well, you know, the N-word is now profane. Right. You know, I I, 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 I want to stay linear. Uh, I usually fail on that. But, I, I, <laughs> but I'm just going to jump to a question that just popped to mind. Um, have you given much thought to what words are coming that things that for instance things that we say today or use in language that might be the next to um to to become uh completely verboten i mean are there are there words put it this way do you have a watch list of of words that have entered uh or entering the language in different ways than they've entered it before or entered the discourse in different ways you know that that's that's an atlantic piece <laughs> right there and i need to start speculating yeah, maybe you should. <laughs> I just start speculating more. And, you know, I'm not a sci-fi person. I usually 
you're making me think right now I am generally more interested in the past than the future. I don't know what that says about me, but I would say that we are only at the beginning of the profanitization of slurring against groups, and it's going to become about other groups. I imagine there might be something about classism that comes into it. Making mm -hmm. fun of the elderly and ableism is probably going to come into it, too. And so, for example, just to take a guess, geezer, codger, those might become, uh, especially among people under a certain age, those might become bad words. It might be that, say, in 30 years, the idea of calling anybody old in a dismissive way will be considered a, a really horrible thing to say. That's likely. What it will be once it's no longer slurs against groups, I truly lack the imagination to say. I can only say that it will be something. It won't be this anodyne world where nothing is profane. There'll right. be something else. Maybe it'll be about the environment or climate change or something. But it's interesting. It probably won't be about the body or bodily functions. No, it won't go back to that. No, because we're just more comfortable. Yeah. right? And, and sort of, frankly, addressing the uh, informality of society post counterculture was the death knell for that. Yeah, right, right. Let me let me go back to the beginning of the book. Um, talk about the brain and talk about put aside the actual words and we and, 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 and their origins and their their particular power and meaning today. Um, why do we curse and from where do we curse? It's interesting. Curses aren't words in a sense. You think to yourself or Carlin, you know, expressed to all of us, why is it that, they, that there are these certain words that we invest with this power that are in a class set apart? Some people, some people even ask the really interesting question, why do such words exist if we can't use them? And the answer to that question is that they aren't words. They aren't reference points. What they are is eruptions. They start as words, but they go over to the right side of the brain, so to speak. So when I'm doing what I'm doing right now, I'm doing it with the left side of my brain. That's where language is located in most people. It's in the kind of Princess Leia coil on the left side. But then on the right side, that's where yelping comes in. That's where words, flavors that are emotional come in. That's where you process tone of voice. So if you yell, fuck, it's not a matter of saying informal word for to have sexual intercourse with, which will come from the left side. You're just yelling something. You might as well have done a seal yelp. You might as well have gone, Ugh! instead you uttered this word fuck that began as meaning something quite concrete. And so what it is, is a whole different physiological process. And that also includes our new slurs in that often, if somebody is using, say, the N word, if they're using it in what's considered the wrong way, especially in a heightened situation, a lot of that is right brain generated as, as opposed to left brain generated. So yeah, our curses, if we kind of roll the dice again, I don't know if we, we, would, we would even think of them as the same thing as language. It's just that we produce them with our vocal articulators. Right. But but curses are all words. I mean, they are words. So I guess I guess my question is you the form of word, yeah. a form of word. But you're so you, let's say you're using a hammer and you bring it down on your hand and you scream shit or fuck or whatever it is that you scream. How did that formulation of letters, how did that sound? migrate from the left side to the right why that one and not linoleum or <laughs> you know or you know elm tree or something like you know like, so I, I'm like how does it how did it how did it get over the 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 barrier inside the brain yeah. that separate you know like what 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 did the larger society do to push that word from the left to the right because if you're not supposed to talk about those concepts, then one way that you blow off steam, if you stub your toe or something like that, is to yell out that concept. Just You can just name it because you're not supposed to say it, and it makes you feel a little better to break a rule. There's that natural human tendency, especially expressed in children, where if you stub your toe on a door, you kick the door back. There's this anthropomorphization process that happens in the brain. It's the same thing here, and so something bad happens to you, and then you just instead of smacking somebody or kicking the door, you're gonna yell something like, vulgar word for feces that I'm not supposed to say. And so it's become a gesture rather than what you're doing is actually uttering, you know, I am calling attention to a heap of feces. That's not what you mean. It's, I know I'm not supposed to say this word for it, and I did, and that makes my toe feel better. It's very primitive. So, so transgression is good. a form of release. The, yeah. the, the transgression is a form of release. Which brings me conveniently to a subject you and I have talked about in the past, which is the future of humor, right? Um, 
why do we like humor? It transgresses. It it tells some possibly unfortunate truth about a human condition that when we're being polite with each other, we don't talk about whatever whatever the understanding of humor is. Um, mm -hmm. But but you and I have both noted. I mean, we are the age we are. Um, that uh, it doesn't. It's 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 a, we live in a fairly grim, serious time. There is a kind of humorlessness. You know, you could date it to the rise of Trump before the rise of whatever, whatever it is in our society. But um, and I noticed that you noticed this because you work uh, with students. I noticed this because a lot of the journalists I work where they're much younger than I am. Um, but there's a much different approach to humor, um, which is a sort of more analytical and critical and careful. Uh, so 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 give us your sense of where all this language. I mean, I was watching some Carlin in anticipation of of um of doing this and you ref you talk about eddie murphy's uh famous uh routine around a word i'm not even going to say on this and f the f word related to mm -hmm. people who are gay um and uh and like there's so much that is not going to be done today that was done even five ten years ago much less you know 25 30 years ago when eddie murphy first burst onto the scene or when carlin was at his prime uh Talk, talk about that in reference to forbidden words. Well, you know, we're in a very interesting time on that in that it's becoming socially prescribed to make jokes that hinge on differences between groups of people. I'll bet I'm just I'm just guessing that there are no human societies where that hasn't been at the heart of humor. Part of being funny is saying they're like this, we're like that. Men are like this, women are like that. I'll bet that comes very naturally. And so it was part of, you know, Anglophone wit, so to speak. And if we're not allowed to do that, and I can understand the, the grounds for it, then the problem is that part of what's funny is the transgressive is breaking the rules a little bit of being somewhat irreverent. And at this point, we haven't lost it completely because I think the tacit idea is that what's funny is dissing the people who are in power, roughly straight white men. What's transgressive is that you knock the suits, you knock the straight white guy. He's no longer gonna have all the power. We're gonna make fun of him and his pipe smoking ways. But the problem with that is that goes a generation. And once that's not funny anymore, I genuinely be interested to see where humor goes if you no longer can make fun, even in a light way, of people based on their group characteristics. And I say, I lack imagination. I wonder what kind of society will be where that cannot be humor. There are other ways of being funny, but goodness, that one is often so central. So I'd be interested to see, but what we are seeing with our, our profanitization of slurs is a good thing in a way. I mean, we don't wanna go back to the way it was 100 or even 75 or 50 years ago. You don't want those words to be hurled around. I think we tend to overdo it a little bit, but doesn't humanity always overdo everything in terms of how prescriptions initially happen? But if we really can't make fun of anybody at all in any way, and I'm not saying we're going to go back to making fun of black people, but if you can't make any kind of joke where this person walks into a room and the other one says, I'm perplexed as to how we're going to express our humanity in terms of wit. I'd like to see where that's going to go. What is funny? And in that, I think you and I sound like the men our age when anti-female jokes stop being funny. I've known men older than us who said, yeah, back in the 70s, all of a sudden women kept saying, that's not funny. And I think to myself, well, yeah, that wasn't that wasn't funny. Wasn't funny right. <laughs> now here we are. Now we're, we're that. And so I don't know where it's going to go, but I'm, I'm reluctant to make a judgment because I don't want to be right. that guy from 1973. Right. I mean, it is kind of a sub theme of your book. It's it's uh, keeping up. In other words, y you know, like like language shifts, you know, um, uh, mores shift, uh, the bounds of the permissible shift. By the way, mm -hmm. open parenthetical, I wonder just just putting this out there for you to chew on. I, I wonder if um, let's just say a particular generation is more censorious or moralistic than the previous generation. Chances are that censorious generation's children will rebel against their parents by buying Eddie Murphy albums. I, I, you know, <laughs> I, I mean, it, it, right. you know, there is a kind of, um, you know, right. like you always have to rebel against whatever the parents are 
are, are are doing. So maybe it just kind of circled. Possibility, yeah. Back itself. I, I don't know. No, but I, I'm interested in um, a, 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 the role of the internet here because on the one hand, you know, you have, and you know, we all see this in Twitter, especially in, in, in Facebook, some policing of language. I'm not, I'm not characterizing it. Some of it's very useful because as you point out, some language, some, sometimes it's not funny. Like it's just not mm -hmm. funny. Um, there's some policing and there's standard setting, right? But then subterranean internet, you know, Reddit groups and darker corners of the internet, it gets really, really, really gross, right? I mean, it's, it's you know, underneath, underneath a, an elevated discussion and maybe even kind of an annoyingly elevated discussion sometimes about what is proper to say and what is improper to say and where the lines are um, is something deep and, and nasty going on. And, and what I'm interested in uh, in particular is the speed at which language is introduced, um, made taboo, brought back, y you know, I, I, I don't, and, 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 you know, we, you and I were both, we were talking about this um, recently. I, um, we were both in the, in, a, in, in word business, right. And um, sometimes it's surprising the speed at which language will change now. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can talk about that. I mean, you know, it makes your job um, certainly less sedate than it might once have been, but mm -hmm. Talk about talk about the way words move in and out of acceptability. Phrases move in and out of acceptability. I'm just fascinated by that. Yeah, the funny thing is that um, linguists are often asked whether the internet speeds these sorts of things up. And even as recently as 10 years ago, I would say it's too early to say. But I would say at this point that, yes, lexical fashions, fashions and slang spread faster because we're all able to talk to each other or write to each other, so to speak. And then things go out. And that definitely seems to happen faster than it used to. And so, for example, about 15 minutes ago, the hot thing to talk about online was hashtag. You know, every second student wanted to write about it. There are all these puckish articles about it all over the place. This is just so wonderful. That now is not something one talks about very much. It hasn't particularly spread. It was just kind of a, a, a craze, came, went. And it was partly because you could talk about it so very much and make so many jokes about it for so, so long. But you know what's happening now is that because we can all talk to each other, in some ways, the way we use language is more like the Rousseau ideal, which was not the, the noble savage, it's say 150 or 300 people living on the side of a river. His idea was that everything was probably best then, and then everything went to hell. And I think that we are in a village in a way in which, for example, in a village like that, there will be taboo words. You know, your somebody's mother died, she was a grand matriarchal figure. For the next couple of generations, you don't say her name and you don't say any word that sounds like her name. And that can be enforced because you're all talking to each other all the time. Now, in a way, we have that again, and I think it's part of why the N-word is not only considered profane, but it's being treated as just a taboo word where you don't even say words that sound like it. I don't think a lot of people know how very much like indigenous tribes in Australia, for example, we've become in how we treat some of those words. And it's partly because we're in a village. This all started with cell phones and then broadband in particular. And so in a way, we're dealing with language that is more intimate than anything that we knew in, say, 1995 or even 2000. And we're still feeling our way as to how we're going to deal with it. What do you personally think of the expression N-word? I hate it. Um, I'll admit it. Nobody's ever asked me that. I feel coddled by it. I'll knuckle under. I'm, I'm using it because that's what everybody wants and you, you choose your battles. But I come from, when did I get this old? But I come from a time when I could just say it and it was considered okay. And not only because I'm black, you could say it with taste if you were referring to it. N-word came in and I remember thinking, why are people presuming that black people are so delicate? And I know that at this point, there are many black people who listen to me saying that and say that I don't represent them. And some of them think it's, well, he's successful or something. I don't think, or I'm arrogant or something like that. I think I know that a great many black people of all walks agree with me on this. But yeah, I don't want to be coddled that much. I liked it when you couldn't use the word as a slur, but you could refer to it with taste 
And it was assumed that everybody knew the difference between the two and that the world had bigger problems than policing that line. That was better. And I'm not talking about 1952. I'm talking about like 1995. So no, I don't, I don't like it, but I use it. I will continue to use it because it offends a great many people so deeply to hear the word itself. And there are other things I would rather concern myself with, but no, I really do wish that I could go back to referring to that word the way I did 20 and 25 years ago, because I am not so delicate as to find it. I'm so, I hate to say this. I am not so delicate that I studiously feign not to understand the difference between somebody saying that would be like naming a team after having a team like having a t football team called the Redskins is like having a football team called the niggers. Somebody white said that and got in trouble starting predictably in the early 2000s. That's fine to me. It's perfectly fine. That doesn't hurt me. I don't think it hurts a lot of black people. I wish that I did not have to attend to a delicacy regarding that, that just was not part of the general general atmosphere until relatively recently. But you know, the internet had something to do with it. And also it's a pendulum shift too far, which is common. It's good that we are so concerned with slurs now, ultimately. Did it go exactly the way I would like it to? No, but then again, nothing does. And who said it had to? But no, I don't like I don't like N-word. I put up with it. Do you think that it's that it's the leading edge of of further euphemization in our in our in our language? Or have you yeah. seen that word separate and above or separate and you know uh more more powerful, more taboo? No, I think that the prescription that we have to use that term models a certain, again, I hate, I hate to say it because my judgments here, I'm trying to be linguist as opposed to commentator. And there's a fine line when it comes to the N word in particular, but it models a certain tendency to police the usage of these words beyond what I'm always sure ordinary people really care that much about, you know, cause you and I both know some of this is partly academia and the media and a certain kind of, you know, NPR listening, arugula eating person. I consider myself one of those people, but you know, we are, we're kind of in a bubble. It's this Twitter bubble. I'm not sure how much society really cares about these things, but yeah, it, it, it's been a model. I'm not saying that the N word is the worst scourge ever in the United States as a polity, but it's never been my favorite, favorite term. Um, let's, um, shift to uh back to some of these 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 words I, I mean it's a it's an easier question for you than the previous question um what's your favorite nasty word and by favorite i don't mean like the one that you gives you the most emotional satisfaction to blurt out when you're angry i mean your favorite because it, it, it it's its origins are so wonderful and, and mystical and ridiculous well the word that has the funkiest history is the F word that refers to gay men, where it starts as referring to a bundle of sticks. And that always sounds so abstract in itself. A bundle of sticks is in people needed bundles of sticks to burn things to keep warm. Like it's a very central object in life. For them, that was like a phone charger, but you have a bundle of sticks. And then gradually that comes to be a slur referring to men who like men. I mean, how in the world did that happen? And it happens step by step by step. A bundle of sticks is a uh, kind of a dummy soldier because you needed to fill out your army for when people were going to come check it. And so you might use bundles of sticks to make the standing crowd look bigger. And so that means that pretty soon the quote unquote faggot is kind of anthropomorphized. Then that starts to refer to a woman when you want to say something terrible to a woman. You're just like this bundle of sticks, kind of like the, the dummy soldier. And then sometimes that's used to refer to children. And so, you know, get out of here, you little faggots. I'm trying to make you dinner. That's something that people were saying. I know specifically in Ireland as recently as the middle of the 20th century. Wait, wait, are you suggesting that parents would refer to their little children? Literally, yeah, little faggots, literally. And then that goes because women and children supposedly are weak. Then that gets applied to gay men. So next thing you know, it's a bundle of sticks to keep you warm as some medieval. And then it's this slur. So I find that interesting. But the one that I enjoy, there's something about motherfucker. It's got this black flavor. It, you know, it's shortened in mother and it has nothing to do with what the words mean. Fascinating. Tell the tell the tell the Don King quote on 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 motherfucker, right? It's uh, why why tell it? Why tell I, it? 
Why don't you just read it? I can read it. Read and so it. we're black. We're blacks and we have nothing. We don't have expensive suits or big houses or luxury vacations. We're poor. All we got is the word. Our only invention that belongs to us is a word, and that word is motherfucker. Nobody can take that away from us. That's our word. That's a black word. We should be proud of that word. It's our heritage. And it didn't start out that way. It started out as ding, 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 ding. Yeah, motherfucker. That's how it starts in the late 1800s. Wait, who are you impersonating there? (laughs) What what was that? It's this this frontiersman white guys who are using it, and it pops up in court. Ding, 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 and they're using it. And so then, it, hey, but you have to go deeper than that. Where where does motherfucker first appear in English language? Motherfucker first appears in court records where white men are complaining that somebody called me a motherfucker, and that's what made me hit the person. And it only pops up at the end of the nineteenth century. It was probably used. Is it before that? Is it is it is it the first? This is first, a, this first. is an Americanism. Yeah, that is our native word. And then, for no reason, I think you could say was cultural. It narrows. Words narrow all the time. And so, for example, if you talk about um, t- discrimination, we both know what that means in the dictionary, but we immediately think about certain racial issues. That's a very narrow sense of what it is to discriminate. Words do that. Motherfucker narrowed in its sociology. And it becomes a black word starting in the 1950s. And pretty soon it has that that flavor with Don King saying those things. And my favorite story on that, right around that time, I have a friend who um, has now been around a long time. She was in her 20s in the late 60s. And she's a very you know, proper kind of Diane Carroll type of person, you know, very much like Julia on the old show. That's who she would have been then. And she's at a party with two black men who are less educated than her. And they were teasing her with a little bit of an edge because she couldn't say motherfucker right. And so to become this black word, I don't think that scene would have worked, say, 15 years before a shift had happened. It had become a black word. And now here we are with it. I had a friend when I was a kid who used to use, like Richard Pryor, he would use it basically to mean a person. How many motherfuckers are in there? (laughs) This word has just changed so much. I just enjoy. And also just the fact that fucker alone doesn't quite work. Like if you speak English, you know, you can say somebody's a fucker, but it's a little incomplete. You have to say motherfucker because that reinforces the word and makes it proper. If somebody says you fucker, it feels a little foreign, a little childish, a little euphemistic. The proper word is motherfucker. I just enjoy that for some reason. I, I've never thought of the expression you fucker as euphemistic, but you know, <laughs> it seems like you're trying not to say motherfucker. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's what it is. But wait, go back to that. I, do you know anything more about like who, who? took the word mother and attached it to fucker and why nobody will, nobody will ever know but it's very common in terms of how people profane a- across the galaxy to say things about what your mother did and possibly with them and so there's a story of the the Siamese twins Chang and Ang Bunker and at mm-hmm. one point, they get chased across a field by a white man who's calling them the N-word, et cetera. And they say in court, and all we have is the document, that he said hard words about us and our mother. That's what they say. Now, it could have been that they said some mean things about their mother and some mean things about them. It could be that that is an 1840s reference to somebody saying you two motherfuckers or something. We'll never know. We You can't know. But that was an example of how your mother and what she does, because probably it was about sex. It wasn't that your mother churns butter or you know your mother has messy hair. It would have been something about sex for them to be that upset in court. And you get that in Russian. You get that in Italian. Just it's all about your mom. In English, that word motherfucker, therefore, was natural. That would have been one of many insults. Why it became one of the nine, 12 words. Some of these things are are chance, but it's not surprising that this incestual thing, and specifically with the mother rather than the father, became a thing. But some of the things about the evolution of it were just eddies in the water, and you never know exactly how things are going to go. But it's it's a fun little word. What's the dirtiest word you know in any language? And by dirtiest word in any language, I mean, in the in whatever culture you're studying, this thing has more awesome destructive power than any other word you've ever seen in any culture across your studies. That varies. It depends on what the culture is hung up about. You know, it could be something about, you know, mothers and, and fuckers. 
it could be, well, you know, if I'm doing a kind of a, a bird's eye view, the ones that say something really mean about a vagina often are the ones that are the nastiest. And in a way, we're talking about the N-word being the worst, but many people would say that C-U-N-T is even worse in American as opposed to British English. For example, I will not say that word any more than the one time I did in the list. But very quick example, Japanese doesn't curse the way we do. The way you be profane in Japanese is different from the way they do it. They they mess around with the honorific levels of language and it has the same effect as profanity for us. They do though have, if you're gonna grab one word that we would recognize as a profanity, they have a word for vagina, which if you shout that out, that's the equivalent of our C-U-N-T roughly. That's the sort of thing I mean. And so that one seems to attract a certain kind of attention. Could you, stay on the c-u-n-t word for a moment and i i'm very much aware that at the beginning of this conversation i said we're going to say all kinds of crazy bad words that word along with the n-word from from my perspective i mean if i had to make a list of of i would call it the shit absolutely not to say list <laughs> yeah. like, just don't say that you know i right. mean uh, the n-word is there at the top but the c word and and you could tell that it's verboten because I can't. I'm not going to in a something that's broadcast with a with a with a you know a <laughs> hoity-toity group you know and a bunch of very you know smart. Listen, I'm not going to say it. I'm just not going to. I mean, but I'm also by the way, it's not a word that I would use in private or I would not use it as a one of the surprising things when you actually go to London, go to go to England, you hear, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is, it is, it is super. For them, it's just salty. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it just it just shows it's it's not invested with the same taboo power. It's um, part of the randomness of these things. Yeah, maybe exactly. maybe you can address why. Well, right, but maybe there's an explanation for that that I don't know. But 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 why is that? Why does that become the word referring to uh, female genitalia that you just can't say when there's other things that um, you know are bandied about? At least among friends and by comedians, um, you know, in 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 fairly uh, open and, and liberal ways. How did that word evolve, and how did it how did it break off in a way from um, from its English variant or its or its English understanding um, and become a word of I don't know what you want to call it, like destructive power or just yeah. um, or just taboo taboo power. It's a fascinating word. And its precise etymology isn't known. It just kind of comes out of the mist because, you know, after a certain point, people aren't writing what, it. What's the first uh, appearance in literature? Well, as far as the first usage of the word in that way, I'm not sure is, what. No, no, no. This is live research. I don't I don't remember what made it into the book because that changes. Let's see. Um. You know, and the funny thing is that because I'm so shy about that word, I don't, I don't even go back to reading. <laughs> it didn't make it has it that much. Okay, I'm gonna get it. Um, yes, yes, yes. I mean, it's obviously, it's obviously one of the most interesting words you could put on a list, be precisely because um, we all understand its power you know, in a way that very few words you're reading. Yeah. You want to know that you're reading your own book and laughing, by the way, <laughs> it's on, a, some, you know, on a Zoom broadcast. Some of these are horrible things. Welcome to the <laughs> pandemic in which famous <laughs> authors read their own books silently, but laugh while you watch. <laughs> I, dropped it. I had various That's takes on it. And festival. <laughs> now I'm actually looking at the book. What we're going to say is that you first start getting references to women as that. Mm -hmm. in the 1600s and you find that just oh, kind of there, not here yeah yeah okay. right and so people you know will say well i was out on the street and there are a bunch of and that's what they mean it refers to women it oh. doesn't mean that the women were of bad temper or something like that it's just a dismissive use and that use continues into the 20th century so you know Hen henry roth that yeah. jewish jewish author that people are always saying you should read and that i never Call get around to 
he uses it as um, just, well, there was a nice looking walking down the street. And so that means that even, you know, depression, and I would say probably 20 years after it was commonly used that way. There are various sources of people at, you know, dance clubs and things in 1911. You know, I could barely get up and dance because there are all these mm, on the floor. And so it refers to women and it means roughly what in street black culture today, ho or bitch means, except this was white men's version of that rapper's dismissal of women. And then I think that the reason that we have such a problem with it today is progress. I think that the feminist revolution succeeded and it made it so that referring to women on the basis of that part with all the implications that you're making about that part, and especially when it's supposed to mean a woman who doesn't know her place, we don't do that. And I think that that's why that word becomes absolutely verboten. Starting in the 70s and by the 80s, it's pretty much in. I have, I'm sure I have never used that word. I've certainly never said it to anybody. I've never referred to anybody as that. And this isn't some sort of male virtue signaling. The point is that during my life, that word has just been too much. You know, I've talked about it. But yeah, that's one where, you know, maybe sometimes I'll use the N-word out full because of a certain obvious sense of dispensation that I have, but not with the C-U-N-T. Yeah, it's, it's, right. it's poison. Do you have any sense, uh, I mean, I know you weren't doing, doing research uh, about the way other cultures use these words, but do you have any sense of why in, in the UK it broke another way to become more, I mean, relatively speaking, benign? You know, it's... I'm tempted to say that it has something to do with sexism being more common there than here, but I'm not sure that I would really believe that that's the reason. There's a certain joke that has settled in, in that culture where you're allowed to be lighter about that particular word and other words like it than here. And so for example, in 1931, there was a commercially released song in Britain called My Girl's Pussy. And it was about a cat supposedly, but the double entendre in the lyrics is perfectly clear. They knew exactly what they were saying. And it wasn't just some little party album that some people listened to. This was a big fancy orchestra and you know, everybody there was just, a -hoo -hoo, and that was just allowed. Here, we would never have been allowed that. That wouldn't have even gone over as a joke. And there are people in British sitcoms making pussy jokes where they always make sure that you know that it's technically about a cat, but they know exactly what they're doing. That wouldn't have happened here. So you have a joke like that on Are You Being Served in Britain, where Mrs. Slocum says, well, getting up this early wreaks havoc on my pussy. And the audience goes crazy. And then, you know, who's going to feed it? And she means her cat. Nobody on Mary Tyler Moore or all in the family could have said that. As advanced as those shows were, Betty White as Sue Ann Nivens couldn't have said something like, Lou, why don't you come to my house and, and see my pussy? You know, she purrs all the time. Unthinkable. There's something about Britain where with that body part, they're allowed to make jokes that we aren't. I don't know if that's cultural. I think it's just that there are random differences in wit and they're allowed to play with that in a way that we aren't. There's also, how are you doing, old cock? Which apparently can be said there. And that means buddy, pal. We don't use the word that way. It's not, hey, Dick. That's, that's not something we would say. Unless your name is Dick. Unless your name happens to be that, yeah. Is, yeah, that's a separate question. Did you talk? I mean, we only have a few minutes left, but I, 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 I I'm always been fascinated by the fact that you live in um, a, 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 an academic environment. You're dealing with people much younger than you're not. I'm not implying that you're old, but you're certainly older than your undergrads. I should a be great deal older. Yes, somewhat older than your undergrads. <laughs> you're obviously, and and people obviously see your writing in the Atlantic and elsewhere. You're obviously a critic of what uh, I think you would call performatively woke culture or the performance of 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 wokeness. I talk about this subject. Your your you know gutter English. Um, in the context of what um, what is happening in terms of I don't know censoriousness or or um, a great deal of judging as you see it of the way people talk and behave and how and how those and how those lines are constantly shifting. I mean, when you when you talk about your work in this subject to your students, do they find this humorous? Um, are they too scared to smile when you say something that's obviously funny or could trigger laughter? Tell, tell, tell me about the uncomfortability of working in this area 
at a time when there's a lot of, uh, again, you know, things that you've talked about publicly, I've talked about the policing of language. Well, you know, that, that's inter an interesting question. I curse a lot in my classes. I think I'm, I'm known for it. Fuck, shit, motherfucker, ass. Those words are constant in my lectures because I simply just lecture the way I talk. I'm a person of my time in that I would never use the slurs. And so I actually, I have a lecture or two that I do on profanity, always have. And usually I say, I'm going to say the word one time so it's clear what we mean, but then I'm not going to say them again. You know what I'm talking about. I've done that with the, the C-U-N-T, for example. Um, now that we're thinking about it, um, I would hesitate to say dick in front of the class or I would only say it majorly for effect. Pussy would be absolutely impossible, although I did it once in 1994 because I felt comfortable in front of the class and I was making a joke about a cat. I did one of those English jokes and I felt bad about it and I apologized the next time. But this is the thing, part of my, you know, people say I'm crusading against the woke. It's not that. My crusade is against the woke who are mean. But part of the reason I feel confident crusading against it is because my students have a sense of humor. I don't mean about the N-word and C-U-N-T, but I find that if any of them have ever been offended that I say shit and fuck a certain amount in class, they haven't told me, nor has anybody told me that they felt that way. Most students have a certain sense of permissiveness and a certain sense of humor. However, if I were going to fire off with the slurs, I wouldn't have my job. And if I were really using them in an impolite way, I wouldn't deserve to have my job. But no, I don't, I don't feel terribly, terribly policed by the student atmosphere in that way. I think they like a professor who just talks the way they talk and talks the way they know I talk when I'm not there. But yes, there's a line to be drawn, including with gender. I would say dick in front of a class, I would not refer to a female body part in front of a class. And I don't mind that. I, I get why that's the way it should go. But yeah, it does. I do worry about humor because I do try to use humor when I teach and I have worried over about the past five years. Am I going to slip and say something that somebody's going to take in a way that I wasn't expecting? It, it worries me. And you know, who knows, maybe it'll happen you know, next year. But I've tried very hard to not have that happen. I think about it. There is there is something to be said very seriously about the uh, about forbidden words um, and the climate uh, in, in which we're existing currently. I mean, and this organization has talked about free speech quite a bit. And and there's a um, and there are people who um, use language to to hurt and destroy and you know, and they work in places where those places say, you know what, we don't want you to work here. Um, there are a lot of academics, we know these stories, who have, in the course of talking about Huckleberry Finn, said words, you know, uh, that uh, students have reported them for, and then the the universities will punish those people. Uh, I mean, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm interested in two final questions. One is your view of, um, the 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 your view of the use of these reporting mechanisms to get people in trouble for talking about a word rather than using the word as the slur um you know getting your view on the record is important i think um we'll just do that one first and i'll come in with the final question i am squarely opposed to prosecuting people for referring to the n-word i think it is trivial I think it is misguided. I think it is willfully oblivious to the difference between usage and reference. And I think it makes black people, i.e. us, look like delicate hothouse flowers who are either strangely fragile or slightly dim. I wish people would stop it. The planet is heating up. There are real problems out there. I think that that constitutes an over sensitivity why dim how do you how do you uh, conclusion it looks like we really don't know the difference and so somebody says something like you know this was a time when the word nigger could be used with abandon and a group of students go and report somebody and try to get them fired it makes it look like they don't understand the difference between somebody calling somebody that word and somebody using it in reference and in critique which and it's very important 
No one cared about that as recently as 25 years ago. And 25 years ago felt just like the end of time as, as now does. Everything was in color. There was electricity. There were computers. And yet it hadn't gone to the point that it has lately. I really do think that it's gone a place that isn't useful and makes black people look bad. That, that is my view of that. And right. that's just my one view. There are many black people who feel differently, but that is definitely my view. Right. Um, I mean, we can go on all day, but we can't. Um, it would be a lot of uh, fun to carry this on into the night. But the, the way to have more fun with it is have to get, done ass. Yeah. Just get this motherfucker of a book. <laughs> um, the, um, it's not that long and it's got a lot of curse words in it. So how could, um, how could it be a bad reading experience, right? It's going to be a tonic after a difficult year. <laughs> uh, so John, thank you very much, uh, for doing this and congratulations on publication of your new book. Thank Jeff, you. Very thank much. you for doing this. Thank you very much. Thank you.